right, so we're here to have a, a quick little chat about really the origins of these um, items that are fairly widely used now to, to measure uh, the notion of populist attitudes. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you, since you're very much at the forefront of this, I wanted to ask you about these very specific items. Um, where did they come from? How did you uh, come up with these specific items? Um, what was the rationale behind the development, let's say? Yeah, Stephen, thanks for uh, this invitation. So, so there is a, a little bit of a story to this. And you the like story, stories. yeah, the story comes through the America's barometer. And so here I'll give a pitch to this uh, uh, now pretty uh, old established um, uh, project at Vanderbilt University and their Latin American public opinion project. They've been doing this regional survey for a while. And after they've been doing it for a few years, I was uh, approached by the director, uh, founder and director, Mitch Seligson, who, um, I mean, he was, he was having me get involved with a Venezuela survey they were doing. And, and he knew I had been studying and working on populism and said, hey, um, you know, we don't have any populism items. Why don't you give it a shot and try to develop something? And uh, I mean, I was a pretty young new scholar and I had never come up with my own survey items at all. And, and I was, was a little intimidated by this, but his invitation was sincere and I could see that this would you know, potentially be a big deal. They would include these items in the in the whole region-wide round of the survey, you know, this is back in you know, around 2007 or 2008. And so working with a grad student, I'm sorry, actually an undergrad student, Scotty Writing, um, and also, and I, I need to give real credit to my Americanist colleagues. They have a, a center for the study of elections and democracy and had been inviting me to join in with them a little bit. And, I realized this would be an important opportunity to get their advice because most of them are behavioralists. They've done a lot of survey work and designed a lot of items. And so we sat down together and started thinking about these. The first round we came up with that appeared in the America's Barometer were not the best. They were not really satisfying. A lot of these were you know, double-barreled items that would include sort of two thoughts in the same sentence. And we were just really struggling with the whole way of doing this. And it wasn't until uh, kind of the, the rest of that year when they said, hey, you know, we know you've done these for Latin America, but we do have an opportunity to run and include these now in, in some other instruments that we're working on just here in the United States. And, you know, maybe you could, maybe it'd be easier to think that way, just do it in English and make it work there and, and do these right. And so, so we sat down again and reworked these items uh, together and came up with something that felt a lot better and was included both in, because again, this was the 2008 elections here in the US and it got included in both a, a Utah specific survey, um, the Utah College's exit poll, and then also in a module we ran in the Cooperative Congressional Election Study, the CCES. And very satisfying, nice results. And so we took those and turned them into, to be honest, we actually tried several times to get this published as an article. And uh, at that point, we brought in Cass Muda uh, to help us to say, are we framing these right? Is there something we could be doing better? And yeah, he reframed it a little bit and we tried again and thought, this is just never going to get published. And the, the barrier to entry, especially for U.S. surveys, is just so high. And he said, look, we can do this as a, a working paper here in this series that's associated with ECPR. And, um, um, and so, so we got it in there. And that's the working paper we have today that presents those first results coming out of Utah and the United States. Well, could you very specifically, looking at the items, could you give us a sense of you know, 
how you came up with those very specific items, what their goal is, what your what should they be measuring? Why did you come up with those particular statements? Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen so we can see uh, the working paper together. And so this is as it finally appeared uh, back in 2012. And you can see again, uh, Scotty uh, there on the list. Um, and uh, he still is working in the, the private sector uh, doing survey research in CAS. Um, and so let me let me zoom down to those uh, those items here, and it'll also take us a second. Basically, what it, what we're interested in is really knowing why these particular items. What do yeah, they do? So, what makes them special? And and what we have here, um, uh, uh, a couple of things happen as we put these together. First of all, we realized that it was interesting not just to try to measure populist attitudes, but also to think about some of these other uh, discurses, discursive frames or thin-centered ideologies that we'd all been talking about, like pluralism. And so, uh, it, it, in part because we knew that in, in terms of measurement, you're going to want to be able to juxtapose this with other sets of ideas and see how they if, they, if they're distinguished from each other, that also interested us. And so we included, in addition to populism items, there were a few pluralism items. And then because we could see some of their connections and knew this was already an existing Americanist instrument, we included the, some of the four items, I think the four main items from the Stealth Democracy series that uh, Hibbing and Tice Morris had already put together. And we were impressed in reading their book because we, we realized that a lot of the material they had from their focus groups people clearly expressing populist ideas and we just thought well it's idea, these ideas these items might work so let's include them as well so we have that now looking back at the populism items what did we try to put in there um, unlike some current approaches that try to break the dimensions down we we uh, maybe unwittingly took a direction where we said instead you know, probably the best way to measure populist attitudes is just by having people read little pieces of populist sounding statements. And that methodologically, I think was actually a, a good move uh, and reflects what we've talked about as populism being a different, qualitatively different type of idea. I mean, if I go out and I measure uh, people's traditional ideologies, you know, whether you're left or right, or whether you're uh, conservative or socialist. And uh, on most of those, you can just ask people, you know, here's a left, right scale, where would you place yourself? And they, they kind of have a rough idea of what that means and they can place themselves. But if I say, how populist are you? People are just going to look at me funny. You know, they don't know what that means. And so how do you get at that then? Well, um, I guess, and I think this is probably true of any, of any discourse then or a thin-centered ideology, you're going to have to show people a piece of it and say, do you agree with that? Does that sound good to you or not? And so that's what we did. Now, when you take that approach, it is actually a little harder to find statements that uniquely express just one element of that. I mean, they tend to combine it all in each sense. So if you look at these items, uh, say, you know, the politicians in Congress need to follow the will of the people, um, pop two. In retrospect, that's kind of a weak item, you know, I, I think you could have said that a little more strongly, you know, the politicians in Congress uh, haven't been following the will of the people or they should always follow the will of the people. So we could have said a little more strongly, but what's in there? Well, first of all, this idea that there is a thing called the will of the people and that it's important and that we should be following it. And second is a sense that, you know, maybe, and we're using phrases like the politicians in a way that just sounds a little, a little bit of a pejorative there, you know, and, um, I, you know, otherwise we could have done this, the politicians in Washington, you know, might have been even a little, just a little more populist sounding. And uh, so that was what was happening, populist sounding phrases that tended to include more than one element, you know, the good people and the bad people. Um, and where we did separate things out, pop one is an instance of this, where we just kind of tried to get this Manichaean quality of the populist idea, you know, that politics is ultimately a struggle between the good, between good and evil. We don't say what the good and evil are. Um, so that, that is probably a, a more careful measurement of the Manichaean outlook that's inherent in populism. 
But then um, number three, again, it's special interests are bad. But then on the other hand, we have something about our country, uh, you know, and, and again, combining elements. So all of these tend to combine those elements. Um, again, just have to give due credit. A few of these came right from my colleagues. I want to say POP2, which has, I think is now, it was part of the, the, the module in the cooperative study of election surveys, uh, the, the populism module they did, POP2 made it in. And I wish I could say I had written that thing myself, but it was actually my good colleague, Kelly Patterson, uh, a, a senior Americanist with lots of experience in survey research who helped us come up with that. So uh, all of us uh, kind of working together came up with that. Uh, you had asked about these other things. So, so you know, what distinguishes this? On the one hand, the, the populism items, they're done a little differently um, than, than sometimes they are right now. The pluralism was us saying, oh, well, let's try to measure that too. And coming up with these was a, a little harder. Um, I, you know, I, I ended up coming up with some of these after reading an, an, an op-ed that a colleague of mine had written. And he's a colleague who's he's very progressive, very environmentalist in his views. And he wrote this op-ed piece for a local newspaper. And when I read it, I thought, this is like a pluralist tract. I mean, I should just, I just cribbed a few of his lines from that and brought it in here and thought, well, that, that sounds pretty pluralist to me. And uh, so that was how these things came from. And I've already mentioned then, the stealth democracy items, uh, Hibbing and Tice Morse that, uh, that wrote those, we just included those. Is there a particular, like, can you say a little bit more about the relationship between pluralism and, and populism and, and maybe get at the exact reason why it was so important for you to include these pluralism items? Yeah, so pluralism, if we think of populism as, and I'll, I'll just use the word uh, discourse here to, for, for brevity's sake. If we think of populism as a discourse, then we also want to say there are other discourses that people uh, use uh, in politics. And one of the main ones would be pluralism, where the idea is that pluralism ha it partakes of the same democratic views that populism has, but it does it in a very different way. And, and pluralism, by the way, I think is the more common uh, language of democracy. This is where instead of approaching politics in a Manichaean way, where we assume that there's a, a diabolical knowing evil out there, an agential evil, like a person almost, or a group that's conspiring, we say, no, no, I think there's, I think there's good in everybody. Um, everyone is redeemable. Uh, even those I disagree with who may have wrong views, I still don't, I don't demonize them. And so pluralism then, it's going to believe in the value of democracy, but, but it sees that differences of opinion are okay. It's uh, a little more focused on uh, compromise and on tolerance because of that. And that's what you see in, in these items here. You know, diversity is being celebrated or compromise uh, that we can learn uh, from our opponents and that we shouldn't just shun them or, or, uh, or cast them out. So, it, so that's where fair, it oh, is. Sorry. Sorry, sorry my, my apologies. Would it be a fair statement to say that pluralism and populism to a certain extent are even mutually exclusive? I, I, up to a point, they do both value democracy. They think that that agency lies with citizens and that that's good. And so we need to make our decisions somehow reflect the, the combined will of those citizens. What differs of course is how they see or how they imagine, you know, do you imagine a series of separate citizens each with their own different wills and ideas and the differences among them are natural and good, or do you say, like populism does, well, yeah, but underlying all of that is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a unified popular will that we need to try to understand and get at. So, so there's actually some overlap. Now, in terms of the items here, if we think about the, the tone that comes across, these ideas are they're pretty different. And so if, you know, as we did in this, paper, you know, when we run a factor analysis, we'd like to see them load onto different factors. 
Um, although, you know, maybe there will be a little crossover on some things that talk about, say, you know, democracy and the importance of, you know, doing what people want. Uh, that, that could be, that sense, you could say that in some ways that would sound appealing to both populists and pluralists. So we tried to make them different, but, but there is some overlap conceptually. Okay, so then considering that these items were implemented in two separate surveys, like what did they tell you at the time when you uh, had them included in those two surveys? What yeah, can let's go down to from this? some of our results here. This is going to be way at the bottom. Um, all right. Because this was very that... new when you implemented these items. You know, we were 2008. So this was very, these were novel insights. The first time that we really got a sense of populism amongst the people. So what did we, what were we able to take away from? So the first thing that stood out for us right away that really, really surprised us was just how strong uh, these attitudes were in the population. <laughs> Remember, this is the United States in 2008. So, you know, towards the end of uh, George W. Bush, Obama's going to get elected and Obama is not a populist. George Bush was not a populist. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a strong third party populist movement since you know, probably 1992 with Ross Perot. And the Tea Party is still, you know, something that none of us have even imagined is gonna happen just, you know, really a year, a year or two later. And yet we see these astonishing results. So these just show you, you know, the kind of average score that people gave for whether they agreed or disagreed with these items. And it shows you both the Utah college's exit poll, the light colored bar, and then the, the US survey, the dark colored bar. And we were happy to see, first of all, that the levels were very similar across these. So, you know, the citizens in Utah and citizens in the United States are really similar on these attitudes, remarkably similar. But also, again, yeah, I mean, these, you know, the lowest one we got was this good and evil question there. Admittedly, you know, it's kind of half the population isn't quite sure about that item. But on all the others, you know, these are well over two thirds of the people saying, yeah, I really strongly agree with those items. And that just blew our minds. And that's something now, of course, that we've seen a lot of surveys since then. And depending on how we measure this and there are ways of trying to restrict our notion of what agreement with these means that allow us to, you know, to reduce and, you know, we imagine, oh, we're getting a you know, real populist when we do this. But the bottom line is lots of people agree with these statements. And that, that really stood out for us. As I mentioned, there were a couple other things that were satisfying to see that uh, citizens in different samples were agreeing on them. And also that they did seem to go together. Now, the, these, these graphs showing you those uh, kind of you know, just average values aren't gonna show the going togetherness. Because again, you could say, well, pluralism, look at that. It also has a lot of agreement there. Uh, these were just done in, in the Utah poll. And yeah, look, you know, so maybe everybody agrees with all of these in the same way. Uh, and this was the stealth democracy. Stealth democracy, by the way, got a lot lower agreement to these. One of the items, uh, stop talking, take action, you know, that, that one did, but the others are, are quite a bit lower. So that's just where we go to our uh, factor analysis. And here we say, oh, isn't it interesting? Even though there's fairly widespread agreement with these statements, they seem powerful to everybody they don't always connect the same way. And so, you know, the people who tend to agree with one pluralism item tend to agree with the others. And the people who agree with one populism item tend to agree on the others. The one where that wasn't true very clearly is the, the good and evil question. And that one was, was obviously a little more orthogonal to these other items from the populism series that were asking about, you know, the will of the people and the evil elite and combining those in various ways. So that was satisfying too, to say, oh, these ideas might go together. And because I think that was an important idea. You know, they might be conceptually separable, but it, I, I, you know, I've always thought at least the people in elite thing would probably, probably go together pretty tightly. Um, and that, that was what we seem to find here. Uh, the other thing we looked at, of course, Stephen, and I don't know if this was your next question, was just to see, yeah, and like, what did that help us predict? I mean, what were the correlates right. of this? So who are we and, talking about here? Who are those people with such high values? Yeah. Oh, and I should mention something too, uh, where we included more of these items in the, 
in the US sample, the, the CCES sample. We also found that two of the stealth democracy items uh, went together pretty well with the populism items. And that was fun. And, and this ended up becoming, I think, the genesis. So you see the other two stealth democracy items are in, are, are, seem to be a factor of their own. And later on, when, um, um, when uh, Andre and, and Agnes and uh, Cass expand this for their paper, they say, hey, wait, those two stealth democracy items, those are elitism items. And they recognize them for what they were, and they expand that, uh, as well as the, the pluralism side, to have a larger battery of items. So we could already see it starting to emerge here. Um, okay, but let, I, I, I said I would look at this. So we looked at a variety of correlates. We wanted to know, first, how did this go with, uh, with political ideology? And our main idea here was that in the U.S., where there is more of a history, it seemed to us of populism going with the right, that it might be a little more conservative, and we did find that. But we also kind of expected it to see it go with just ideological radicalism generally. You know, so you could have people on the right and on the left. And what we found was that, you know, in the sample, it was more on the right, but in on the left, it did kind of go in the direction that we that we expected to a little bit maybe. So there were some hints at this kind of bimodality of populist attitudes. Um, we looked at some other things. We, we were a little unsure, you know, how will this play out with education? And we thought that it might be that more educated people would have weaker populist attitudes. And that is what we found pretty strongly here. That's, that's been a pretty consistent results along other countries, but, but not everywhere. We don't always find uh, clear correlates of education or wealth, uh, income, and populist attitudes. Here, though, it did shake out like we expected it to. Um, we didn't find that partisanship was particularly associated with populism. And so even though we had that, that nice ideological correlate, especially at the extremes, mm -hmm. you can have populists among the Republicans or the Democrats or independents. And that was nice, too, because we, we certainly we didn't, we didn't we didn't think populism was you know, just owned by any one party in the United States or elsewhere. Um, the one exception was third parties. <laughs> and so, and then we thought again, oh, that makes sense. I, because uh, as we looked more at the speeches of third party movements in the United States, uh, so again, these are movements that are, that are not in the two traditional parties or even in some of the fairly consistent uh, other parties that run, but these sort of new movements that spring up and protest things. Well, you know, gee, that sounds like something that might be populist. And and in looking at their speeches, we certainly found that third party movements in America have often been very populist. And so we we, we see that uh, come through here. Uh, there's a little bit of an age thing going on, although we've seen this effect flip back and forth across different countries. Sometimes it's older, sometimes younger. And um, I don't know that we have a good theory about uh, how age works. And I think a really important non-finding was that gender was not strongly associated just with the attitudes. It might be with voting. Uh, for example, radical right parties in Europe, we know strongly appeal to men, but the attitudes in the U.S. were, were not strongly one way or the other, male or female. And we, we kind of liked that finding because, you know, we didn't see a reason why women couldn't have populist attitudes like men. It does seem to be more of a feature of people's belief in popular sovereignty mixed with, you know, a little bit of that Manichaean outlook. We did find one um, clear connection with, on issues. Uh, again, given that in the U.S., certainly recently, populism has been more strongly associated with the right, and much like in Europe, uh, you know, kind of a Trump radical right, we certainly saw that already in 2008, positions on immigration were really closely associated with populist attitudes. Okay, well, thank you very much for these insights into the very first, the original populism items and, and where they come from and what those first findings tell us. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Uh,